being an artist, an educator, and a parent of a teenager certainly doesn't make me a specialist in cells or teens. If anything, it makes me desperate. So everything you'll hear today is personal and probably wrong, or is it? Let's remember for a minute at the promise. The promise um, that we used to call the information superhighway that became the World Wide Web, the promise for the perfect tool for communication, learning, and democratization. We were promised superpowers. Instead, the promise grew, evolved, some of it mutated, it developed a very dark side, and eventually moved into our phones. We watched our cell phones reinvent themselves from the absolute communication devices into bad, daytime talk shows, promoting and answering sponsored reactions to everything we need and everything we don't. We also watched cell phones devour, package, and sell our most precious commodity, our attention time. This is how cell phones became our pacifiers. Every time they're out of reach, we get cranky, we throw fits, until we get back our hands into them, only to be rewarded with a healthy dose of dopamine. This resulted to the following problem. Our kids are spending more and more time on their devices, addicted to living virtual lives instead of real ones. We also suspect that many of the platforms and social media software out there is engineered, designed, and aimed to develop, to, to deliver addictive multi-sensory experiences. This is the data, it's ugly stuff, um, but what we see and we summarize is that we have a clear and present danger of emotional and physical peril. Now, what worries us the most is that grown-ups are as addicted as teens, if not more. So uh, even though we have the experience and the supposed wisdom, um, after all, we are the last generation of parents to know the world without cell phones and the internet. So why talk about teens and not talk about ourselves? Well, we are the grown-ups in the room. It's simpler to project. And kids are easier targets. So are cell phones the devil? Come on. We have to stay positive and proactive about this in order to have some effect because very little else has proven to be a solution. Now, if you don't understand how severe the problem is, let me put it this way. If I have to be the positive run around here, we are really in deep trouble. <laughs> Here's the idea, the pitch. Cell phones are sketchbooks but not in the sense when we're talking about the process of art, but the art of the process. And why take uh, an artistic direction as a means to correct the problem? Number one, artistic practice and process are the only things I know. Number two, artists are children too. We just want to make pictures all day long even though no one asks for them, is paying for them, or even likes them. <laughs> Number three, we are addicted too. We're addicted in making one thing after another until it kills us. And then only hope there is some kind of a studio, lab, or printmaking shop somewhere in hell so we can continue. What is a sketchbook? The etymology should be helpful. 
ancient Greek, the word schedon means almost or nearly. It becomes schedio, an offhand plan or drawing. In Latin, becomes schedium, schizo in Italian, and eventually becomes sketch. Sketchbook is really a empty book, a book of empty pages, not even lines to restrict mental flow. Who uses them? Anyone that turns thoughts into ideas, drafts before making, visually brainstorms, or is brave enough to tackle an empty page, scribble by scribble, line by line, to make something happen. Why do we use them? Sketchbooks are a place. They're a rare place where we can get some creative, productive, quality time with ourselves, where we can achieve deep REM thinking, thinking we can record, edit, further develop, and restructure in order to use in an effective way when our idea gets exactly where we want it to be. Against all trends, sketchbooks work with a method that is based on slow gratification. We are so accustomed to be using instant answers, to be looking for instant solutions that we instinctively go to our phones to see what everybody else has used. This way, we skip on our original thinking, and we keep brainstorming out of our process. Eventually, we end up having no process at all. We get used to pureeing our food for thought to a degree where we're going to be left without teeth. Let me give you an example. A student of mine a couple of years ago present a poster featuring a large photograph of an egg, a bad egg, low resolution and terrible writing. When asked why didn't you use a better picture of an egg for your poster, he said, this is the best I could find on the internet. When I suggested, why don't you take an egg from your refrigerator, put it under any lighting conditions you want, turn the high resolution um, function on your 12 megapixel telephone, and take a picture. He said it never crossed his mind. <laughs> now, it sounds funny, but it's very sad to watch a developing, creative student struggle without process to such a degree where the tool actually takes the lead in the process and dictates the end results. Let's go back to the pitch. Now, we have to admit that calling cell phones sketchbooks is a very antithetical proposition. It's the perfect match of obvious opposites. One of them is high tech, the other one is no tech. One has everything, the other nothing. Processed, raw, public, private, loud, quiet. One about outcome, the other about method. React, act, instant, delay, dynamic, stable. 799, and I'm being kind here, to 7.99. One about profit, the other not. One of them is the grid, the other is off-grid. Addiction in one, paper cuts in the other. <laughs> as the worst thing that can happen to you if you, use, so if you use sketchbooks. Now, no matter what teenagers are into today or they will be tomorrow, we still know one thing about them, they are natural born artists. So here are some ideas for, um, for our issue in certain levels of um, engagement. Number one, on the individual level. Because we know that as babies, we have to be able to entertain ourselves in order to be self-sufficient and individual. Now, we have a, a problem where we cannot match time with task. So, when we cannot entertain ourselves and be self-sufficient, we can't be crying for attention while jumping into the social media vortex. Every time we're bored. We can be bored in our minds instead of be bored out of our minds. So how can we do this? 
we can use and develop a thank list and maintain it on our phone. And here's a little paradox to actually illustrate this. On one hand, we all have assignments, projects, or issues to resolve that require thinking in order to have that solution. On the other, we all have even a little bit amount of downtime. Miraculously, these two never meet. So whenever we have issues to resolve, we have to resolve them under um, time restraint. And when we have time to kill, we really, that's what we do. We jump on their phones and we actually burn it. If we learn to combine through a list that we can activate every time we have available time, we can actually make them work for each other. Now this is a dad's think list for a teenager. Um, ways to give, uh, what to give a friend for a present, Halloween custom ideas, find a cost to fundraise for, word of the day, ideas for a theme party, proposing a ch change in school regulation or a new lunch menu item in the cafeteria. So they can be funny or serious, they can be complex or simple, they can be long term or not. Now, the natural connection between our concept and education would be art class. That's where students, along with their other projects and their painting and their sculpting, they can actually be taught by short workshops on shooting properly and visual writing. This way, this combination could help them to actually digitize, save and present their work. On a very different level, we know very well that in elementary school, um, media literacy class is the class for digital learning. If we extend this class to middle school into social media literacy class built around devices, yes, of course, we'll help um, students utilize in a productive and creative way their platforms, their apps, and everything else the extended toolbox of our cell phone has, but it can also provide within that class with the support and methods to deal with feedback, criticism, and negativity on the web. This is what we call cell defense. On a more serious aspect, it could also develop the strategies to protect against predators and online trafficking. Let's move away from this and go into history. History classes could benefit from photo scavenger trips directly linked to regular curriculum. This way students will go and provide imagery and roads taken on site in order to have a way more personal approach to history. This way, um, for example, American Revolution at Bear Mountain, based on a personal approach in personality, artifacts, place, patterns, and details. Other than training a thinking eye, this would also teach history in a very engaging, active, interesting, and memorable way. After school is always looking for interesting ideas to offer. So other than how to take better selfies or how to design custom-made emojis, it could really provide classes that have to do with advanced writing and studio classes for better photography so we have better posting and more advanced blogging. Now, this would also empower students to be able to reach out and also help fellow teens that are struggling with painful issues by developing positive and inspiring peer-to-peer -peer relevant content that others can reach out for help, help that actually grown-ups never are able to, um, to provide. On the institutional level, museums, botanical gardens, aquariums, could benefit from turning their space into a photo game. Participants, we would be collecting specimens, documenting them, resolving riddles, 
and also providing ideas with an entire reward system that would be, um, that someone would be able to go to the gift shop and get the reward. Now, the same institution could also develop publications, anthologies, but also online and offline content that would be based on all the materials that came in in that fashion. I think the benefits would be obvious, confidence, awareness, processing, real, improved, proactive, preserving, restrained, creative. So, the message is, um, is fairly simple. Use your cell phone as a tool before it turns you into one. But mastering or cell phones is not exactly only for a way to control or over texting or addiction to social media. It's about being able to cope with every single new technology coming our way. It has to do with choosing to have private lives and being the ones that really decide what percentage of those lives is occupied by technology. Artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality are here to push us forward. But how great would that be if we're not really there? Can this work? Could we effectively develop social media etiquette? It would take initiatives, it would take partnerships, and it would take determination. Yes, it also would take bribing. But we will call it rewards. It's going to be in candy, slime, or even frequent flyer mileage, anything that it takes. But deep inside me, something tells me that our kids are going to be so much better at this than we are. They will know from not walking around like cell zombies with devices stuck to their noses, all the way to mobilizing to what's really important and resolving global issues in ways we never could think to imagine. After all, I was invited here by a 16-year-old, and I think this is a sign. Now, let's be honest. My theory has more holes than a spaghetti strainer. But just like in pasta, we don't care about what flows out, but what remains. In my experience, young people will flourish if given the opportunity to develop the real voice in sketchbooks or cell phones. Now, if this is not true, let's all bask into this glorious light that comes out of our cell phones and lose ourselves in someone else's exotic vacation photos as soon as this sentence is over. Thank you.